You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Dr. Lisa Koltenegger is the director of the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell and associate professor in astronomy. Her research focuses on exploring new worlds orbiting other stars, especially rocky planets and super-Earths and their atmospheres in the habitable zone. She is a world-leading expert in modeling potential habitable worlds and their detectable spectral fingerprints, which can be detected with the next generation of telescopes. Dr. Kultenegger's new book, Alien Earths, The New Science of Planet Hunting in the Cosmos, is out now and available from the Event Horizon Book Club. Dr. Lisa Kultenegger, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me on. Now, Lisa, you have a new book out, Alien Earths, The New Science of Planet Hunting in the Cosmos. And one of the interesting things about this book is that you're at Cornell, and the director of the Carl Sagan Institute. And you also are the current occupant of Carl Sagan's office at the university. Now, that must be pressing in and of itself, but the fact is Carl went his entire career almost without even knowing that exoplanets even existed. No proof, we highly suspect it, but no proof. And now that we've seen those exoplanets, we're seeing a group of exoplanets that are very, very, very different from this planet. What was your experience with the discovery of the first exoplanets? I have to say, I'm sitting right now in Carl Sagan's office and I'm looking out of the window and it would have been the exact same view that Carl had. Fair enough, the trees are a bit taller and the fashion is a little bit different. But it grounds me in really, really busy days just thinking that it, he would have come in and waited a moment and thought and looked out of the window. And so I do that. And in a way, it's a bridge through time for me that reminds me that it's really important to take that time to think and make the connections between different facts, between different fields. And so it's great to come in every day in the morning and reset a little bit and think these things again, to come in every day and take that extra minute just to collect your thoughts and think about what is the important thing I want to tackle today. And when I just started studying in 95, that's when they found the first planet around a sun-like star. So the amazing thing is that in my worldview, we went from maybe there are planets out there to we found the first one. And it is so hard to find these planets and our technology is great, but it's not easy to do this. So we knew by finding this first one that there must be so many more out there for us to be able to find this first one. And so a complete floodgate opened of these diverse worlds that kept coming in. And so I was starting to study. And in my second year of undergrad, there was this first conference, one of the first conferences ever on this new world, on these extrasolar planets. And it was, you know, I was in Europe. It wasn't that far away. I didn't have much of a budget, but they had a little bit of a grant for students to go there. So I took like one of these last minute flights for tourists, you know, where you're like packed in like crazy with everybody else who goes hiking and so on, because it was in Carchez in an island close to Italy. And then I was the only person who took like the bus to that conference. And in that conference, there were maybe like 50, 60 people professors and students and postdocs that were thinking about these new worlds and what the questions are that we should ask and what the things are that we should tackle first. And that again changed my view of how science is done because I wasn't aware that, you know, a student could actually help out or that my opinion would count in a field as important as, you know, NASA's or ESA's search for life in the universe. It was like a big thing. I'm from a small country in a small town. So I didn't really think I'd be able to take part in this. And so when the first planet was found, the worldview of everybody shifted a little bit. And then when I started to think about this in more detail, you know, what are the questions and found out that nobody knew anything because it was just so new that everybody had questions and we had very, very little answers. That 
changed my personal worldview again because it showed me that I could be part of this, and that's what I've done ever since. And you know what's interesting about it is that in those days, I remember them too. Nobody really had any expectation of what exoplanets were going to be like. We just knew about the solar system. But since we've looked out, we see now thousands of, of exoplanets that we know about, over 4,000. But we see planets of a type that we don't have, hot Jupiters and super Earths and things like that, that as far as I remember, weren't even predicted. I mean, do you remember anybody predicting what we would find? We were predicting what we would find, and we were, of course, basing it on our own solar system. And in our own solar system, we have four small rocky worlds close to our sun. And then, a little bit further out, we have four gaseous big planets further out. And the idea behind that is that when you're close to the star, it's really hot, so gas and ice tends to evaporate. And the stuff you left with are rocks. Those crash into each other and form bigger and bigger rocks. These are the rocky planets, the first four in the lineup from the sun out. And then at a certain distance from the star, it gets cold enough that gases stick around and ice sticks around. They don't evaporate anymore. And so the planets can be made out of rock, ice, and gas. This is where you find the biggest planets in our solar system, Jupiter, and then Saturn with the beautiful rings, and Uranus and Neptune. And so that's all we knew. And this is all that we expected out there. We thought, well, you know, it makes sense. Story, you know, you can just make these rocky worlds close to a star and then further out you find the big world. And the first surprise was that we found a planet like Jupiter, but in a very tight orbit whizzing around its star. And with tight orbit, I mean, it took the planet only 4.5 days to circle its star. And that planet, 51 Pegasus B, basically has a year that starts Monday morning and is over Friday afternoon. So if you'd like to celebrate your birthday more often, feel free to call yourself a 51 Pegasus observing person for birthday purposes only. And then you can get to celebrate once a week and have all your friends come over. But what it just shows you is how different these worlds are. And that was just the first surprise, because we learned that these giant planets that form further out can move inwards, they can migrate. But in the solar system, the smallest rock is Mercury and the biggest rock is the Earth. And then the smallest gas ball is Neptune and the biggest gas ball is Jupiter. So that's where we were expecting planets to be, like what we were expecting them to be like. But we found that most planets we have found so far are actually in between these two brackets that we have in our solar system. We call them super Earths if they're rocks but more massive than the Earth, and mini Neptunes if they're gas balls but less massive than Neptune, the smallest gas ball in our system. And so a huge surprise was that there were planets out there that we hadn't suspected at all because they don't exist in our solar system. But this is where it's fun to be at the forefront of science, because if you find something new that you haven't expected, this is when you learn the most. If everything is as you expect it, there's not much new stuff you learn. But if it's completely different and the diversity of these worlds has just floored us, has surprised everyone, that's when it becomes really interesting because you have to puzzle out why this diversity exists, what you were missing in the story of how you form a solar system, a system around another star with many planets. And that's where the fascination on the forefront of science is for me to basically put these puzzle pieces together and figure something new out. Now, I don't think it's finished yet. I don't think we know all of the rules yet on exoplanets. No way, yes. And we're still finding outliers. Tell us about that. Well, absolutely. There's no way we found even like a part of the rules yet. And so the interesting thing is if we just take a glimpse at the diversity of these worlds. So one of the fundamentally fascinating things were these hot Jupiters. Jupiters that were somewhere where they shouldn't have been, right? Not from our understanding. So they migrate in. Jupiters can move from outside to close to the star. But we also found 
very small rocky worlds that don't even take 24 hours to whiz around their star. And so there are rocky worlds out there that take about 18 hours to go around their stars. So the year is over in 18 hours. And that means they are so close to this hot star that they are baked by the heat and the light of that star. And so their whole surface must be covered with molten rock, with lava. And so we are starting to get actually data, get like observations of these worlds. And so here at the Carl Sagan Institute, one of the things we implemented with the Earth and Planetary Science Department is a lava world lab. Because we know how our lava looks like, but we don't know how rocks that are completely different, for example, I have more iron, less iron, whatever you want, how they would look like to our telescopes. And so we have a tiny, tiny world made out of these rocks that we mix, mix together and we measure what they would look like to our telescope, what their light would look like to compare it now with the observations we have of these new lava worlds. But these are not even the weirdest worlds out there yet. Now, the lava worlds, let's, let's dig deeper into that. So say you have more iron, significantly more iron, and maybe, I don't know what I owe, I don't even know what its geology looks like on this, in this regard, but if you start adding in iron, mm -hmm. presumably up from a less differentiated world than Earth, then what does that look like geologically? And what can you tell from a distance about the lava of, a, of an alien world? That's exactly the questions that we're trying to get to. So the first step will be that if you have a certain rock composition, let's assume we put more iron in, usually makes it darker, but when you then heat that up, the light that it emits, that it sends out because it's so hot, so the heat it emits really, that is different than the heat that a lava would emit with less iron. But nobody knew how different. And so we actually had to build the setup in our lab to figure it out, to make that kind of rule book, that database that would allow us to say, okay, now this is the light we got from this lava planet. And now let's check it against all these different chemical compositions of lava we know that we've done in the lab. We made that composition up, you know, with good educated guesses, but we just added more and less chemicals into this rocks into these minerals and then heated them up to see what they would look like when they glow. And this is a fundamental first observation of these lava worlds that's just coming in that will allow us to tell what the composition of the lava on these other worlds is like. And then your next question was great. You know, what does this mean for the geology? What does this mean? You know, what's going on on these worlds? That's the next level of modeling that we're doing right now and trying to figure out how that would actually influence what the interior is like, what an atmosphere is like that such a planet could have. Just imagine you have a lava ocean, you now it evaporates, but it's super hot there because you're so close to the star. But at a certain distance from the surface, it gets cold enough that that lava will build rocks that keep raining down again. And so in a um, you know, as I hit Chaika's Guide to the Galaxy, it probably would say it's a beautiful lava world, but be careful not to be caught in the lava rain. Now that's that to get even deeper. So we have volcanism in the solar system other than Earth. We know what our volcanoes look like, but we also have the extinct volcanoes of Mars and the moon and things like that, that, that we can use to look directly at this. And then we also have obviously wildly active Io, which presumably is going to be volcanic for <laughs> forever. So how do the planets of the solar system help you in, in envisioning the conditions of these lava worlds? The planets in our solar system teach us so much. They do teach us about our own world. For starters, we know that the greenhouse gases can be this effective because we have seen Venus and know what would happen if we had many, many more greenhouse gases. So Venus is basically an example of what happens if CO2 gets out of control, if the greenhouse gas goes out of control and you lose all your water. While on Mars, when there are sandstorms, that actually taught us that these particles in the air 
would actually reduce the temperature on the surface of a planet everywhere. And this is where Carl Sagan and collaborators also figured out that a global winter would be a disaster for the whole planet. And so if any one nation would come up with a nuclear war and would ignite such a weapon that would cloud out the sun, that it wouldn't be a localized problem, that it would be a worldwide problem. So we're learning so much about our planet. But the example that you were making about these beautiful volcanoes all over our solar system, especially Io, is one other data point about what the material in such volcanoes could be like. One other data point in our uh, database of what lava could look like if you look at it from far away. And so we have our own planet and then we have Io to have a look what the composition of this lava could be like. And then we look at Mars and all the other planets in our solar system, figure out what the composition of those surface rocks are, and then envision what it would have looked like and we can do that in the lab, we can heat that material up and say, so this is what a Mars-like planet would look like if you melt it. So if you're so close to the star that you can catch the glow of the melted lava on the surface. Now, one thing I hadn't thought about that you talk about in the book is that Earth in its earlier history was a lava world. <laughs> and it was much worse than now. But during the period just after Proto-Earth was hit by Thea and the moon was flung off, at least that's the current favorite theory for the formation of the moon. Once that happened, then you get a situation where the moon is out there in a molten state, solidifying, but it's exerting tides on the lava oceans of Earth. Do you think that that's, I mean, do you think about that, <laughs> for example, when you think about these these other lava worlds, that our, our world was once a lava world and a lava tide world? Absolutely. This is where it becomes so fascinating to think about a world in terms of time, because I don't think if you were to go back in time that you would even recognize our planet because you would have no more Alps, no more Himalayas. You would have completely different continents the further back you go in time. And even the stellar constellations will change because stars, of course, in these constellations don't move with each other. So they would basically become very different and very alien to us. So if you were a time traveler and landed on a very young Earth, then I don't think you would recognize that you are in our planet. And if you were seeing it, because you wouldn't want to land at that point, at the time where it just had been hit by this huge body, Martian-sized body called Thea, that propelled some of the material out to form a ring around our planet. And in that ring that coalesced and basically crashed together and made our moon, I think about this a lot and I think about how fascinating and amazing that few must have been on the sky you of course on the earth you would have been very careful because the magma wave would have gone around the whole planet without stopping but the moon that you would have seen in the sky would have been so different it would have been like a dark moon but with cracks where you could see the glowing lava underneath and it would have been also much much closer because the earth rotated much faster and the moon was much closer early on in their gravitational dance so just imagine in that alien sky and recognizing that it would have been our young planet, but everything would have been so different that recognizing it would be impossible. Alien Earth, but I can't help but wonder if an alien civilization was passing through in a starship and they looked at molten Earth and they were like, well, we'll come back later. And then they come back, but it's, <laughs> it's, it, they, they get back, by the time they get back here, it's the luminosity of the sun has increased such that it's back to molten. And they're like, well, nothing happened there, <laughs> move on. <laughs> so it, it is a timing question. I do agree with you, but I hope there's a civilization that knows how to navigate between the star and has interstellar travel 
they'd also know how long it takes for a star to become brighter and brighter and hotter. So hopefully they would catch the time where this molten, initially molten planet would be just at the right distance, not too hot and not too cold, and go and look at that point in time. It all depends on if they cared. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, to take this even further, extreme exoplanets, what is the weirdest exoplanet you know of? Well, I would say the weirdest exoplanets we've found, and that was just a few years ago, is a planet that orbits a stellar corpse, what we call a white dwarf. So when a star that's more massive than the sun explodes, then it leaves behind an exposed hot stellar core. The other material, about 50%, gets thrown out as a planetary nebula. Bad naming, because at that point they didn't know that it was actually the residual of a star that just exploded, so they named it planetary nebula. It's nothing to do with planets, except in the far future when this material will build other planets around other stars. But this core that's exposed through that explosion, this incredibly hot core of the dead star, a stellar corpse basically, we didn't think that planets could survive around such a stellar corpse because there's an explosion, right? The, the planet's not going to stick around and say, oh, okay, that's fine. I don't care about the changes in gravity. I don't care about this explosion like going through me. It will get destabilized. It will crash into the core. It will get flung out of the system. That's what we understand. That's how stability works. But the TESS mission, so NASA has a small mission called TESS that I'm the, on the science team on, that looks at all the stars in the sky, the closest and brightest one to find interesting planet, found this weird signal around a stellar corpse, around a white dwarf. And it turned out to be a Jupiter-sized planet that goes around this white dwarf. It's called 1856, in case you're wondering. So WD, white dwarf, 1856. And Andrew Vanderbilt has found that. He's one of our uh, people in the test mission. So we were puzzling over this because I had wondered before whether or not in the future there could be habitability around stellar corpses. But it was just like an idea, a theoretical concept that I had proposed. And then Andrew found a planet that survived. And so all of a sudden, this hypothetical became maybe not practical because we're talking about a Jupiter planet around this stellar corpse. But if there were a Jupiter planet that could survive, then maybe a rocky planet could survive too. And then if you factor in the tenacity of life on the Earth, the question becomes if whether or not life could potentially also survived the death of its star and that would lead to a far future when most stars exploded of the universe that still had a chance to be teeming with life and so this is where it is so fun to look at the weirdest planets out there and just look because a lot of times our preconception of what's possible has been thrown out of the window by these amazing fascinating new worlds we found that was hinted at those. I remember one of the earliest exoplanets or exoplanet systems found was around a pulsar, <laughs> it, which is, that is about the worst case scenario you can get. That's exactly true. So that's the worst case scenario. That was in 92. That was three years before Didier Kalos and Michel Mayor found this planet around a sun-like star, so a, a star that still shines and has nuclear fusion. And a pulsar is so much worse, right? Because the explosion that creates a pulsar is so much more volatile and so much more strong than the one that creates a white dwarf. So we have really bad explosion and really, really bad explosion. And then if it's even worse, then you create a black hole as a residual of the star. But there, the question was that these planets were very small around the pulsars, or these objects were very small around the pulsars. And so the idea was that probably they could have been caught. We still do not know how they got there. We do not know if they are actually survived the explosion. And again, that is very, very unlikely. But what's so different with this new planet is that it's big, that it's a Jupiter it, it can't, we have no way to form it in a secondary 
disk, right? Once the star exploded, there is no way that we know of that you could actually form such a big Jupiter object. So the best idea we came up with so far, and this has only been like, you know, two, three years right now, is that a planet that was very far out would have migrated in. So basically pretty similar, like the first time around the planetary system gets made and then creates these hot Jupiters that we also weren't expecting. And so there's a lot of mysteries out there, but stellar corpses are not counted out yet. But the advantage of a white dwarf over the first ever objects around pulsars found in 92 is actually that the environment is not that bad once the core has been exposed and cooled down a little bit. And so my team calculated that you can have about four to five billion years of nice, stable, temperate conditions around such stellar cores, white dwarf stellar cores. But of course, we didn't think that the planet could survive. We were just kind of wondering what the conditions would be like and so on. And now that we have the first giant planet around those, I'm really wondering if rocky planets could survive the death of their star too and what that would mean. You know, that's interesting because that is the sun's future. It will go red giant and then it will come back down to white dwarf. Will Jupiter still be here and will it migrate? You know, I mean, what will happen? And will it keep its moons? Yeah, will it hold on to its moons or will they, they be tossed out, rogues? But you could also ask questions like, as that red giant phase occurs and the habitable zone moves out, it eventually gets to Jupiter and those ice worlds. <laughs> what happens then? <laughs> exactly. And this is exactly, you know, I, I, I love this conversation because these are things we have been working on to try to figure out when this habitable zone will actually hit Saturn and Jupiter and whether or not there's enough time to actually melt these icy moons and make them worlds covered in liquid oceans and whether that would be a time when you discover life if it actually started subsurface and was always like guarded or basically sheltered by these huge ice layers like on Europa and Enceladus we have subsurface oceans but under huge ice layers. So without going there and drilling a hole in the ice, I'm not able to say if there's anything living in that ocean because the ice layer is in a very effective barrier for any gases or any signs of life that could come out. And so when you fast forward into the future of our solar system, then the habitable zone will move outwards because our sun will become brighter and brighter like every star. And so the solar system's habitable zone will shift outwards and hit Saturn and hit Jupiter and it could melt those ice balls, those icy moons and make them warm water worlds for a while. And to think about that, there's a couple of spooky things there. So say that they don't have life, the ice shell moons, and that those oceans are sterile for whatever reason. We don't know what, you know, how abiogenesis really worked, but say that they didn't have life, but that liquid ocean, a surface liquid ocean is what's important. Well, as soon as Earth got that, life appears almost immediately. It took almost no time once the conditions were correct for life. And so you could actually see during that period, if indeed they go, you know, they have enough time to completely melt, you could see abiogenesis in a dying star system, <laughs> right? And that is the really interesting question, because now that we can look at planets, it doesn't have to even be moons, but it could be like planets that we knew must have been iced over initially, but the star is at a stage where it would have melted those. If we were to find signs of life on those planets, that would exactly go to the question you just asked, you know, could it actually start right then and there? Even so, the system is evolving and evolving quite rapidly, becoming hotter and hotter, would there be enough time to get life started there again if it hadn't started before? And once again, that life, which is in the case of the sun, going red giant and then shrinking back to white dwarf, that it's gonna go extinct <laughs> relatively quickly, you know, compared to our type of abiogenesis. And so this is basically what we thought until we found a giant planet around a white dwarf. Because if that happens fast enough, life would just have to survive for a little bit before it gets close enough to the white dwarf that it's nice and warm again. 
Yeah, and you can play with ideas because there are organisms on Earth, extreme organisms that can freeze <laughs> and come back. Exactly. <laughs> and sometimes a very, very long time. <laughs> If you look at the tardigrades, for example, those can like shrivel up when water is rare. And then basically they can suspend most of their processes and they can live in this suspended tune stage for more than a hundred years. And we have no idea how long they can survive this stage because we just haven't had enough time to test out if they revive once you put some water again on them. We know that it's at least a hundred years. It might be a lot longer. And this is also, of course, now we are completely in the science fiction realm, by the way, like when we're thinking about like life on planets around white dwarves after the explosion of their star. But of course, these kind of really extreme life forms and whether they could evolve or not, that's also what the three body problem, you know, this new right now, it's a TV series, but this amazing book actually plays with thinking about different life forms that are completely different from ours and have different capabilities. And so it's really fun to think about this and play this forward. But we're not there yet. We have found of the first planet around the corpse of another star, a white dwarf, where it could be nice and warm for billions of years if you had a rock that might have surviving life or that might start life all over again. But We are not at the verge yet where we can actually have such a rocky world around this dead star and look at the atmosphere because that's incredibly hard to do. But we're keeping our eyes open for these really strange and wonderful, weird worlds while we're doing our best to have a look at these worlds at the right distance, not too hot, not too cold, around their small red suns in our neighborhood to see if those worlds could show signs of life too in their air. Now, another related question. What about living planets, potentially living planets in multiple star systems? You know, I mean, look at Proxima Centauri. It's, there's three suns there. So what about that? I mean, can that sort of play into this as well, having multiple stars? Oh, absolutely. Having multiple stars will be a given for many, many worlds because about 50% of stars are not alone. They have a stellar companion. And there is no reason that those binary systems wouldn't have planets around them or triple systems. And you have a different place where that would be stable because, of course, the gravity of both stars now pulls and keeps the planet in orbit. And so it's just a different distance, but there's another habitable zone around these binary stars. And I was really curious where that was. So I wrote a paper on where that exactly is. If you do, if you circle one of the two stars or both stars. And so there is this zone, this habitable zone around binaries. And what I'd love to imagine is if you were standing on that surface, you would have a double sunrise and a double sunset. And of course, you would always have two shadows. Two shadows and your 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 existence would, would seemingly look a lot like Star Wars. I know, but where was the second shadow on Tatooine? Well, you would have to ask George Lucas. I will. <laughs> I, and I would imagine you'd say, oh, well, I hadn't thought about that. See, he should talk to me. Yes, absolutely. The difficulty of searching for exoplanets. So from this point forward, what is it that we can do to increase our ability to, number one, discover exoplanets, but number two, characterize them? It's always about how much light you can collect, how much information you can get. And so the way to do that, that astronomers are always trying to build bigger telescopes because bigger telescopes just collect more light. And the way that I explain that in class is think about a rainstorm. If you have a small bucket, then you get only this much water in a rainstorm. If you have a big bucket, you get more. And so the same goes for light and telescopes. The bigger your telescope, the more light you can collect. And the more light you can collect, the more information you can get out of that light. And the way we do that in astronomy is we take that light and we split it in its colors, like white light and a rainbow when it hits a water droplet, right? So you see the different colors of light. And then you check if there's energy that's missing in the different colors of the light. Because 
if light hits a molecule on the way to us, then it can make that molecule swing and rotate. But that uses up some of the energy of the light, a very specific one, because each molecule has a very specific structure. For example, water, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, has a different structure than, for example, oxygen, O2, two oxygen atoms together. And so you need a different energy to make each molecule swing and rotate. And so when the light gets to me and I split it up in its color, I generate a spectrum. Then I look if there's absorption features in that spectrum. What that basically means is if there's parts in the spectrum where less light gets to me than there should be. And then I can go and in the laboratory, I can do this experiment where I fill a see-through canister with, for example, water vapor, and I shine light in from one side and see what light is missing on the other side. And then I can cross-compare with what I get from that star and its planet. Is there light missing where water would absorb, where water would swing and rotate? And so then I can tell you, ooh, there's water in the air, water vapor in the air of that other world. And I can do that for many, many molecules. And, you know, if it gets too hot or too cold, or if the molecules become poisonous, then we do it with quantum mechanics and we calculate where these lines should be, where this missing energy should be. And in a way, like stamps in the passport, these missing energy signatures in light let me explore which molecules the light encountered before it got to my telescope. It's going to be a lot more of that. As a scientist, thoughts so far on the James Webb Space Telescope's observations and work with exoplanets? Amazing. We got so lucky that the James Webb Space Telescope, that is for the first time, big enough to collect light from these small planets that are rocks and at the right distance to not be too hot, too cold, so in the habitable zone, for the first time that is even possible. Because the telescopes before were just too small. We didn't catch enough light from these tiny, small worlds to be able to split them up and to be able to see the absorption features. Because when you put the Earth about a hundred times next to each other, that's the diameter of the sun. So you're looking at a planet that's very small and it's not very luminous, right? Because the star shines, but the planet only reflects light. So you look for something very dim next to something incredibly big and bright. So you need a very big telescope to be able to do that, to collect enough light from a small dim source. And for the first time ever, the James Webb Space Telescope actually allows us to look into the air of these rocky worlds around other stars and figure out what the chemical makeup of these other atmospheres are. So we really live in a golden era of exploration right now. But this is not easy because sometimes it sounds easy. This is at the edge of technical possibility. We need to add the light up in many, many observations. So it takes months and years to get enough signal to find any of this chemical species in the air of these small worlds around other stars. Astronomers already have a look out to the future where we say we want an even bigger telescope that can look specifically at these rocky worlds at the right distance and figure out whether or not there are signs that have to be attributed to life because we have no other explanation. And we call that concept the Habitable World Observatory. And we're currently designing how that needs to look like. And this is why we're making these models of other worlds, what they could be like, and what other signs of life could be like. Taking the Earth through time as our model, taking the diversity of the biota on our planet as our model, to not miss signs of life if they're out there. Now, one thing that people often ask me about is that all these exoplanets that we see, yeah, we see them around pulsars and white dwarfs, but fundamentally, the ones that are of interest as far as life goes, we're, we seem to see them only around red dwarfs. And I try to explain, well, that's the easy star to look at for this. When you start getting into bigger stars, it gets a lot harder because of glare. 
Do you think we can get past that problem? I think we are really lucky that around these small red stars, so about eight out of ten stars out there, actually small red suns and not a yellow sun like ours. And we found that they make a lot of rocky worlds that could be like ours. So rocks at the right distance around red stars, it's one out of five. So if you count five stars, most of them, as I said, are red, red suns. Most of them, as I said, are red stars. So one out of five of these stars harbors at least one planet in this habitable zone. That is actually really lucky for us because these red worlds are much smaller because these red stars are much smaller than our yellow sun. So now a planet the size of the Earth makes a much bigger signal in the light of a small red star than it does in the light of a yellow big star. And so you were talking about glare, but it's also about the contrast, just how many photons, how much light you get hit with from the star and how much light comes from the planet. So yes, we can do this technologically in the future, but right now we have to concentrate on the easy targets. And the easy targets are these small stars where a planet like the Earth actually leaves a much bigger footprint that we can, at the edge of technical possibility, but for the first time ever can read and look into and try to identify signs of life on it. In the off chance that a giant star is able to either capture or form a planet before, you know, for its, its short lifetime, it's not probably not going to get the life, but say that it did. Could you even tell that with radial velocity? I mean, with giant star and a small terrestrial planet, it's not going to create much of a wobble, right? No, so the bigger the star, the more massive the star, the harder the whole search gets, let alone the characterization. That's even the next problem after that, right? It's an even harder problem than just finding the planet. Characterizing it is even worse because if you want to characterize a planet, you want to look at the air or the atmosphere of that planet or its surface. And so the signal becomes even smaller, a fraction of the signal of the planet itself. If you think about our planet and you shrink it to the size of an apple, then the atmosphere is thinner than the peel of that apple in comparison. So the signal you're looking for is so much smaller. And so if you make the star bigger and bigger, but the planet, you still want an Earth-sized, Earth-like planet, the planet stays the same in size, this observation becomes so much harder and is currently impossible because it's just such a tiny signal you're trying to find. What'll be interesting is future techno signatures that I don't think have been thought about very well yet. And one of these would be the impossible planet where you have a Mars-sized world that shouldn't be holding an atmosphere that's of a sufficient age that it should have lost it, but yet it's got a big thick <laughs> atmosphere or something like that. And then you see another one at the next star system. And then you start getting into these sort of esoteric techno signatures that can also be present in addition to biosignatures. Any hope, you, what is, what's your personal view? Any hope that we will even see a technosignature or do you tend to think that civilizations are rare? I tend to think that if you look at the history of the Earth, then we know that if you think about the Earth as a 24 hour clock, it's history, right? Then around 5 a.m., 3.5 billion years ago, roughly, we have the first solid proof that there was life on this planet, probably was there before. Around lunchtime, about two billion years ago, you actually have this combination of gases, oxygen with a reducing gas like methane, that generates this golden life fingerprint, the combination that tells you that there's life on our planet and the combination that we're looking for in other worlds because we cannot explain it on a nice, warm, temperate world like ours, except if there's life on it. But then in this 24 hour clock, humans come onto this clock not even a second before midnight. And radio signals, a fraction, a fraction of that, right? Because we have only used radio signals for about a hundred years. So the searching, the philosophy of how you search is different, whether you're looking for techno signature or whether you want to look for life. 
And techno signatures also often imply that somebody wants to communicate and somebody wants to send a signal. And that could be everyone if there are civilizations out there, or it could be no one. Maybe we are different. Maybe we are curious, but maybe nobody else is. So I think finding a civilization would be incredibly interesting. But the chances to catch life, if it's out there, are much higher if you passively search for the change a biosphere actually brings to its planet. Like on Earth, since two billion years, our biosphere has changed our planet profoundly. And then it depends on if you're an optimist or pessimist, how long you think these techno signatures will go into the future. And I'm 100% with you on that. I hope we're going to find planets that shouldn't be habitable and warm and nice anymore, but they are. And we figure out that other civilization managed to actually stabilize their climate, to actually engineer, bioengineer their climate so that those worlds remained habitable. Because that's really what I hope for our planets for the far, far future as well. The different phases of Earth. Now, it's been altered by its biosphere. And we talked about the initial phase of the molten Earth. But what comes after that? What, what did Earth look like through the ages? Earth is a beautiful planet that, if you think about it in terms of color, was painted with a paintbrush with different, different colors so, so far. And so in the beginning, you had this lava world, so glowing lava everywhere. You had the crush that formed the moon, so it was a hot, inhospitable place. But it had this incredible, gigantic waves of magma circling our world. Then our moon starts to move further away. The two bodies start to solidify. You start to get these huge oceans when it's cold enough that all the water vapor actually falls out and forms a liquid. And then you have it as this blue planet. And then little by little, the continents start to poke out of this beautiful, huge ocean. But these continents initially, of course, are more like gray because there's no vegetation yet, nothing green, of course. And so you keep going and then oxygen starts to become abundant in the atmosphere about two billion years ago. And that should have rusted the surface of our planet. That just means it oxidized it. So there should have been a time where we looked like a young Mars. So with red continents in these blue oceans, what must have been a gorgeous view from space. And then little by little, you start to have vegetation that gets onto those continents that become bigger and bigger and bigger with times. Of course, they move all over the globe. They hit each other. They create amazing mountain ranges that we don't even have names for. And then they break apart again, hit each other again, create other mountain ranges life starts to go on land. So basically the environment with an ozone layer becomes really nice on land as well. So no more harsh UV radiation. And maybe that was one of the reasons why life actually started to colonize land. And so now you get the colors that life brings. At first, probably a kind of darkish green, and then you just have this diversity of vegetation that starts to take over the land. And then you have this green land masses in this blue oceans. So it is beautiful to think about what different faces and what different colors our world presented. And we going back to what we have discussed initially, I don't think you would be able to identify our planet if you landed on it and it was in a different time era. You know, except if you land with the dinosaurs, then you would probably say, ooh, I know that this happened. But earlier than that, it'd be so hard because there would be no landmarks and no life that you would recognize. I think my favorite one is the, the very early stages of land where you had these giant, I think they're called prototaxites, giant funguses that are 25 feet high, something like that. Um, and that's when fire began <laughs> on Earth was when those things could actually combust and um, Earth again changed. Now, Dr. Kaltner, you have a new paper out recently regarding the Jurassic period and how Earth might actually have been more detectable as an inhabited exoplanet than it is today. Tell us about that. 
So the interesting question when you're looking for the combination of gases, oxygen, and methane, is was there ever a time in Earth's history where there was actually more of it? And of course, when we think back, when we had these colossal dinosaurs moving and roaming around the Earth, they were there because there was much more oxygen available, much more energy. And so it is interesting to think about that actually such worlds, such Jurassic worlds, would actually be easier to spot life on than even now, because we went down to 21% of oxygen, and we think during the dinosaur area, we had about 30, maybe a bit more percent of oxygen. So more oxygen, a bigger feature, easier to find. And of course, that opens the question, could there be other big organisms out there in space? And are there any dinosaurs somewhere else? An analog of the dinosaurs living on an oxygen-rich exoplanet. That's interesting that it does. And, and you're talking about a lot more oxygen because if it got up to 35%, which some estimates say, if it got up that high, which I think those were based on actual findings in amber, preserved amber of, of little bits of the atmosphere, bubbles. But if that's the case, then Earth now is 21%, way less so that would be a significantly higher signal as far as the oxygen goes. What was the methane like, though? The methane was pretty much the same or a little bit more than now. So again, easier to find. And what you were saying is absolutely true. It is fascinating that we do not know why we have 21% of oxygen, right? Yes, I can explain it with sinks and sources on the Earth, but there's no real reason why you should have 30% or 32 or 21 or 25. We just know that at one point, around 35, you hit a regime where fires would continue to burn and you wouldn't be able to take them out anymore. And so that's probably an upper limit on how much oxygen you can get. But where a planet ends up in terms of its oxygen level is not a calculation we can make. It's more an exploration where we have to go and observe and try to find out what other planets actually harbor. Now, inside this is a, somewhat of a mystery. And how did we get to 21%? And that began at the end of the Cretaceous and actually killed, I believe, I mean, tens of genera of dinosaurs were already going extinct. They were on their way out on this planet when the asteroid hit. Do we have any idea why the oxygen levels dropped? Whenever there is fresh crust material, like for example, when continents break up, when there's something new rock is exposed, that can get oxidized. And that oxidation requires oxygen, and so that brings down the oxygen in the air. And this is just one process how we can lose oxygen. And so this movement of plates, these crashing of plates into each other and forming new rocks and breaking up again, will mitigate or will change the oxygen content on a rocky world. But it's very hard to tell what it should do. And so we have a lot of ideas why the oxygen was starting to go down. And the rock record tells us that it went up and down and then maybe up again. The rock record is also very hard to read in that detail. So that's a fascinating half mystery of rocky worlds, what kind of oxygen they should end up with. If you don't know the geology and the biosphere on a planet, there's no way that you can predict what kind of oxygen level it should have. And so what we'll need to do is find the oxygen level, the signals in the light on another world, and then interpret what we see. Is it a huge biosphere and not much of exposed fresh continents? Or what's the combination? What will make it again? A really interesting question to explore. One interesting paper I've read covered the idea of ocean levels. And if ocean levels are dropping and locking up in ice, that exposes new land <laughs> right into the, uh, the oxygen, and that too can oxidize. And it's an interesting thought. So can we take this so far as to say, all right, we see a planet with 30% oxygen. Can we say that it is in an analog of the Cretaceous, or is just a, too much of a stretch to say that because it's an exoplanet, it's not Earth? I think what we can say is that it looks like an analog of the Cretaceous. And we can say that 
that oxygen would actually support much bigger organisms than us. And then I was joking before that there might be other dinosaurs out there. What kind of life, how it would look like, that we have no idea of. Because even on the Earth, life is so diverse that it's really hard if you didn't know about it. Like, for example, life in the deep oceans. I wouldn't be able to predict what we find. I'm still surprised by some of the organisms we keep finding. And they evolved on my planet. And they evolved with me. So I think uh, stretching our imagination and trying to figure out the diversity of life that we could encounter out there that requires a lot more imagination that we currently have put into it and will be another really exciting part of the search in the far future where we can identify what kind of life actually creates these gases in these signatures of life in the air or on the surface of other worlds. But there is one thing we can do. We can look for plants through the vegetative red edge, right? So we can look for plants and we can actually go further than that. So the vegetation red edge, the green plants, have a very specific reflection pattern. So they reflect some light and don't reflect other light. But there is lots of different biota that isn't even vegetation. And if that were dominant on another world, how would that look like? And this is why we created the color catalog of life here at the Carl Sagan Institute to collect enough or as many, to collect as many different colorful biota types as possible, not just vegetation, and look for the vegetation red edge, but then also for carotenoid edges and other things to not miss signs of life, of biopigments. If they just happen to be a little bit different than what we see currently in our front garden. It'll be fun because Earth, there are things that Earth has not done as far as life goes. And trying to think about something that's completely unfamiliar that might have happened there. But there's just so much chance involved with evolution. You can't really predict a species, but you might be able to think about things like convergent evolution. And what, say it's a super Earth, twice the mass of Earth you might be able to start thinking about what does gravity do to evolution, you know, that higher gravity and those sorts of questions. But that's really all you can do without going there, <laughs> unfortunately. Other worlds with completely different environments, completely different gases, completely different gravity, for example, we have an idea how the physics must work, right? For example, stronger gravity, you probably need stronger bones, or you're probably going to be closer to the ground because it's going to be more work to actually stand up against that gravity. And then four appendices seem to work really well to move around terrain, you know, that's not completely flat. And so there are some commonalities that we'd expect even in biota very, very far away on other stars and other worlds that have nothing to do with ours. But that's where it ends. What color the biota would be, what form it would take, how many eyes it could have. Like, just remember our own Earth. Two eyes is not the norm for every species here. So that's going to be fun to figure that one out. But that will require much, much bigger telescopes and much, much more time. So as a first step, I'm settling for finding hints and signs of life in the air or on the surface of other worlds. And then let's go from there. Before oxygen, what would have been detectable at the earliest life on Earth? Anything? So the question is how sure you want to be about the detection of life. And what we want to do is we want to be conservative because what I want is I want to have a signature that I cannot explain with anything except for life. And so that means if there's CO2 in the atmosphere, that can be created from biota, but also could be created from geology like volcanoes. If there's methane, like early life created on the earth, that can also get created by geology, like volcanoes, for example. So it's not a unique sign. So while there was life for a long time on the earth, for at least 3.5 billion years, much likely much longer, but 3.5 billion years ago, we have the first solid proof that there was biota on our world. 
we can tell that there was life there in a unique way where I can say, oh, I'm sure, until it produced oxygen and the combination of oxygen with a reducing gas is a signature I cannot explain except for life on a planet like ours. So in short, it's easier to detect a dinosaur world than it is a microbe world. That depends. But I completely agree, but... There is always an interesting detail here because what if this microbial world has like beautiful, let's say red colors, an algae carpet that basically blankets the whole planet in this gorgeous red. Then reflected light would all of a sudden be fire red. And maybe that would actually be easier to spot than any dinosaurs walking around in groups. I would actually enjoy that world, a giant algae world that's having global algae blooms and it keeps changing its <laughs> changing its color. That would be an interesting one. Absolutely. I agree with you. And so imagining that diversity of worlds led me to say, come on, we need to find out what the colors of the diversity of world actually looks like, right? What are the different colors? Which one tell you that there's biota? And we taking the diversity of life on the earth and its different colors to imagine how such another world could look like if just one of these other organisms that didn't become dominant here on the earth because our circumstances were specific ones so our life and animals and vegetation became dominant but under different conditions something else could have become dominant and some other biopigments might blanket another world and that's something that we could spot in our telescopes if it's widespread enough and this brings up an interesting point because life on Earth can change color, especially seasonally. You look at the trees. And if you saw an exoplanet that was bright red and then it changed on a, on a schedule to bright green <laughs> or bright brown, you know, or something like that, and you saw this happening, I guess you probably have hemispheres and all that and differences. But still, if you saw it, that's, that's quite a biosignature, right, if that can happen. I think that change would be definitely, definitely call our attention. And especially if that change were linked somehow to either the position of the planet around the star or to some kind of distance, like if you were in an elliptic orbit, so a bit further away from the star and closer to the star at other times through its circling, its host star, then definitely. But you also have to be a little bit careful because if I just take water and ice you would also have a change of water to ice in such a situation. So you would have a very dark, non very reflected surface water to a very bright reflective surface ice. And so you have to think through what the planet could be like under these circumstances. What else in addition to biota could change that could mimic a false positive, a false signal? And so this is where a lot of the effort is going right now in my team and teams around the world to imagine false positives, things that we might falsely think are life, to be able to pinpoint the barometer space or the things where actually we have no other explanation than life. But it is fun to imagine a biota that would actually change seasonally with the distance to the star. Because as you said before, we see the planet as one dot of light. So we would see both if it was inclined like ours so that you have like winter in the northern hemisphere while you have summer in the southern hemisphere, we would see that as an average. So we would actually not see any changes or not many changes, right? Because we would always see both hemispheres. But if the location of the planet would be just a little bit further away through some time when it goes around the star and just a bit closer through other times when it goes around the star, that is an over overall change in the biota on the planet that we could see, but we'd have to make sure it's not a geological signal that we're mistaking. Now you'll find even more information on this stuff in Dr. Kaltenegger's new book, Alien Earths. And what, what, what motivated you to write this book? We are living in this amazing time where for the first time we have a telescope that can do this, that can actually collect enough light at the verge of technical possibility, super hard to do, but 
possible for the first time ever. So we all live in this amazing time where we could figure out whether we're alone. And I think that might not have registered with most people. And there's so many things going on, so many things going wrong in the world right now. But this step, this monumental step of us looking up and being able for the first time ever to do this, to explore these other worlds, to figure out we're alone, that shows what we can all together do when we put our heads together, what things we can accomplish. And I want people to realize what amazing time we live in right now and to live that time with us on the scientific forefront. But also, to me, it's always hope that against all odds, against you think, oh, people don't understand each other anymore, they can't talk to each other anymore, we can pull together and we can do things that seemed impossible, like looking up at the stars, finding planets that are so small and hidden in the glare of their stars, and even trying to figure out if there's life on these faraway worlds. Dr. Kaltmeniger, it's been a pleasure. And where can everybody get your new book, Alien Earths? Hopefully you can find it everywhere. And I do hope that it changes your view of the night sky just a tad and brings you ever closer to these other worlds and imagining that and figuring out what we need to know to be successful in our search because we live in this golden age of exploration, all of us. And so look out at the sky, count to five. One out of five stars has a planet that could potentially be like ours. Maybe somebody is looking right now somewhere else too and wondering if they are alone. And everybody, there will be a link to the new book, Alien Earths, in the uh, description below. And Dr. Kaltnegger, it's always a pleasure. And I look forward to doing this again sometime. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you as always. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.